let me go ahead and start over. So welcome everyone uh, to Far Hill Speaker Series for October. This is a collaboration between the Wright Memorial Public Library and the Oakwood Historical Society. And today um, we have Dr. David Schmidt presenting on the old barn club in the golden age of the Hills and Dales Park. Um, David is Director of Undergraduate Programs in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Wright State. Um, he grew up exploring the landscape south of Dayton and puzzling over its rocks and fossils. And this interest in geology led him to complete his BS and MS at Wright State and his PhD at Ohio State University. Uh, he's a lifelong resident of South Dayton area and a consulting member of the Oakwood Historical Society. And he's been contributing to the Far Hills Speaker Series um, for a number of years. And um, I'm very happy uh, to have him here with us today. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to David. So why don't you go ahead and unmute and it's all yours. Well, thank you so much, Brian. Um, and welcome everybody. It's great to be here with you and to know that you're, there are so many of you out there who are interested in some of the same kinds of things that I am. Let's get right to it. My objectives for this presentation are to describe for you what I consider to be the golden age of Hills and Dales Park, which ran from the park's opening about 1907 up through the mid 1920s or so. So we'll talk about the development of the park, some of the activities in the park, the camp shelters that were there. And I also want to illustrate how the old barn club, this facility pictured on the upper right, served as the hub of the park's social activities during that golden age. First, a little bit of background. This is Colonel Robert Patterson. He was a Revolutionary War veteran and settled into the South Dayton area back in the early 1800s or so. He was a very successful farmer and businessman and eventually acquired over 2,000 acres of land in this area to the, in the shaded area shown um, to the, in the lower part of the, the slide to the south of the city. He, his land stretched from the soldier's home way out to the west, all the way over to the Wilmington Pike area in the east. Colonel Patterson built the Patterson Homestead. This is a, a historic home that stands between Oakwood, or rather Brown Street, and Far Hills, just north of the Oakwood-Dayton boundary. This is uh, in the hands of the Dayton History Organization, and they have wonderful open houses and teas and other gatherings there. The front porch is shown up uh, to, the, to the right of center. And if we move our way up to the front porch, here's a modern day view of the front porch of the homestead. And if we go back in time to about the uh, late 1880s or so, we see some of the Patterson family and relatives there um, on and around the front porch. The lady seated on the porch is Julia Johnston Patterson. She was Colonel Patterson's daughter-in-law and she, a couple of her sons are shown here off to the right with his hand on the back of the chair is one of her boys, John Henry Patterson, who was president of the National Cash Register Company. In the late 1890s, Mr. Patterson decided to improve the appearance of the grounds surrounding the NCR factory. Here's a photograph from about that time frame. We are looking across Brown Street towards the NCR factory from the area just north of where Holy Angels Church is now. For this landscaping, Patterson called upon the expertise of John Charles Olmsted, this man here, who began making regular trips to Dayton from his well-known firm in Brookline, Massachusetts. He was one of the 
um, sons of Frederick Law Olmsted, who was a very in influential landscape designer during the latter part of the, of the uh, 19th century. And John Charles and his brother kind of inherited their father's talents for laying out landscapes and kind of preserving some of the natural beauty of areas. Olmsted and his colleagues directed many landscaping improvements to the NCR factory grounds over the years. Here's the results of some of their work. We see beautiful shrubs and flowers and vines and other plantings. They are making National Cash Register a more attractive uh, factory environment. In 1902, Mr. Patterson built on high ground to the south of NCR, a new home that he called the Far Hills. The Olmsted firm once again consulted on landscaping, consulting on the layout of Patterson's new home and uh, in the plantings that occurred there. The Far Hills stood on the present day East Thruston Avenue where the Lutheran Church of Our Savior is now located. And if we go back in time a few years, this is what it looked like there on that, on that, uh, on that land. This is Mr. Patterson's Far Hills mansion that was situated with a beautiful view to the north northwest of his National Cash Register factory complex. Patterson loved entertaining. He entertained many visitors at his home. People that would come to the factory would also come up the hill to his home. One of the more popular attractions among visitors to the Far Hills was an Adirondack style camp, an outdoor camp that was situated just south of his house. Patterson loved vacationing in the Adirondack area of upstate New York, and he owned some land there and he brought back with him to Dayton a, an appreciation and a feel for the style there. So the Olmsteads consulted on, on, um, on getting this Adirondack style camp situated there and visitors love to go out for a, a picnic there on Patterson's grounds. The design of the lean-to camp shelter at the Far Hills, the shelter that we see off to the left, would soon be used throughout another one of John H. Patterson's projects. In early 1906, Patterson began acquiring substantial portions of land in what he and many other people referred to as the hills and dales south of Dayton. So to get you oriented to this map of that area, this is a, an early view of the area south of town. I think it's important to point out that this was not long after the whole region had been clear cut for farming. And so it was before our modern suburban forest grew up uh, like my father used to say, this was pretty wild and wooly farmland, and well to the south of Dayton and in an area that was hard to reach because um, the roads were not very good and, and transportation to the south of town really wasn't all that great back in that time. But anyway, Patterson began acquiring land in this area to get you oriented. In this view, we have Cincinnati Pike, which is present day South Dixie off to the west. It's running through what's marked as, as Carmont. This is part of the old Southern Hills neighborhood. And just, be, just above the Cincinnati Pike uh, name there, we see Calvary Cemetery. Lebanon Pike stands to our east. This is present day Far Hills Avenue. And you see that there's not a whole lot going on around Lebanon Pike. What we think of as East Oakwood off to the the right side uh, farmland and a few scattered houses there along Lebanon Pike. Dorothy Road, I think that needs no explanation other than that was um, named after Mr. Patterson's daughter, Dorothy Forster Patterson, uh, running, and we see that obviously running east to west here. So um, most of Patterson's early land holdings were in this area comprising now what we think of as Hills and Dales Park, portions of West Oakwood, the golf course, but uh, he also had property to the south of Dorothy Lane and that expanded beyond what's shown here in later years. Part of Patterson's interest in this property to the south of town was to have fields 
and bridle paths for horseback riding. He loved horseback riding. Here we see him at the far left in this picture, um, mounted on his horse. We see Edward Deeds next to him and a whole host of other NCR executives. In this image, they're out on what I believe is now Dayton Country Club's golf course. And I think the trees in the background are what we think of as present day Hills and Dales Park. But Patterson was something of a fanatic with horseback riding. He grew up on a farm. His philosophy was that if a man can't control a horse, he can't control a man. So he had his business executives riding horseback in the morning before the factory opened. And um, much to some of the um, amusement of, of early citizens who referred to them kind of derisively as, as Patterson's rough riders. But anyway, he wanted a place for horseback riding and he uh, purchased this land. So he once again called upon John Charles Olmsted who began planning the roads and the landscaping in the park. Here's some of the uh, construction on the early road in Hills and Dales right after Patterson purchased this farmland. Here's a nice shot of a rustic bridge in Hills and Dales built for foot traffic. Um, horses and horse-drawn traffic, maybe the occasional automobile if one wandered out this far south of town. Here's another view. I think this is the downstream side of that same bridge, and we see some of Olmsted's plantings kind of stabilizing the um, embankments along the creek there. So Olmsted laid out the roads and planned the, the, the bridle paths and, and all of the plantings in the park. The Hills and Dales property consisted mostly of former farmland. Among the structures in Hills and Dales were a large barn and a farmhouse that stood near the barn on high ground. And so in this image, we see an old barn at the left. This was built into the hillside, kind of on the edge of uh, where the golf course is now. Uh, and then to Upslope from that, there was this farmhouse, which is kind of hard to see, but it's behind uh, kind of a cluster of trees there, but a big, a big farmhouse. And then off to the right, we see a smaller house. To get situated in our modern setting, this is about that same view. These structures stood just to the north of the present day intersection of West Dorothy Lane and Winding Way Road. So we are, uh, uh, the uh, Ridgeway Road Bridge is just up uphill off to our right in the area where Community Golf Course is now is back to the left background uh, beyond the stop sign. So going back to our historic view of that same area, uh, the, the, the barn was in the, the hillside over on the edge of the golf, where the golf course is now. Patterson decided to combine these two early buildings from Van Buren Township into a clubhouse, which involved moving the barn up slope and connecting it to the house on the house's west side. So once that was done, this is what the floor plan of the clubhouse looked like. We see the barn off to the west joined to the farmhouse. And then here's a view from the back of that clubhouse structure. We see the barn and then this beautiful old two-story farmhouse with the dormers up on the third floor. I think Patterson's earliest plans were for Hills and Dales were him for, for it to be mainly used by National Cash Register employees for recreation. Uh, but he also had in mind I, for a long time having a park. So he gradually allowed local citizens to make use of his park also immediately right right about 1907. And I think it's useful to point out that this was back in a time when Dayton had almost nothing in terms of public parks. Many of the major cities around the country did, especially in the east, thanks to Frederick Law Olmsted and some of his initiatives. But one of Patterson's many criticisms of the city of Dayton government was that there was no nice park for people to go and walk through the woods. We had the, the river banks and we had the levees along the rivers. People could kind of walk on them, along them and stretch their eyes a little bit. 
Um, we had Calvary Cemetery and Woodland Cemetery, but not much in the way of a nice place for people to go and walk through the woods. So this, this became very popular. Another example of Patterson's uh, uh, allowing people to, the public to use the park was this newspaper article from 1908. It talks about how the scattered citizens of uh, Oakwood and Van Buren Township met to discuss a taxation amend uh, amendment at what the newspaper referred to as the Dorothy Lane Clubhouse. So this is our clubhouse building a view of it soon after it was built. We're looking at the barn side and I believe the local architect Louis Lott had a hand in the design of the, the, uh, of, of, of the clubhouse. The Dayton Automobile Club leased the clubhouse from National Cash Register in 1910. This was at a time when uh, Mr. Patterson was out of the country for a while. He kind of got himself into some hot water politically around 1907, and he um, maybe not coincidentally left the country for a couple of years and went over to England to help set up NCR's business there. So Hills and Hills Park kind of languished a little bit while he was gone, but he came back in 1910. But by then, this newly formed Dayton Automobile Club, which had an office downtown in the old Algonquin Hotel, which still stands along Ludlow Street, leased the clubhouse for a, a country destination for their members. And so here are some of the members of the Dayton Automobile Club posing on the steps in front of the clubhouse. Um, it's, I think, a good thing to keep in mind that back in this time frame, there weren't very many automobiles on the road. They were kind of a novelty. They were expensive toys and not all that reliable. But there were a few few people in Dayton who had automobiles, and they would come out to their to this country club, this this remote site south of town, for some of their dinners and meetings and parties. In 1912, the Dayton Auto Club welcomed their colleagues from the Cincinnati Automobile Club for a, a gathering there at the clubhouse. This newspaper article mentions there were 192 cars in all that formed an enormous caravan from Cincinnati, drove up to the South Dayton area for this party at the uh, Dayton Automobile Country Club and the members here in Dayton had it all decorated with banners and flags and streamers and signs welcoming their friends from Cincinnati for this gathering. The newspaper article mentions a chicken dinner was served in the main dining room of the clubhouse as well as in the tents on the lawn behind the clubhouse. So we just see in the background of this photograph some of the tents out there behind the clubhouse. And here are the guests from Cincinnati leaving the clubhouse. The photographer, probably William Mayfield, ran up to the second floor and snapped this picture of the guests going back to their cars. Uh, we are looking out toward the south end of Mr. Patterson's wonderful Hills and Dales Park here. We see West Dorothy Lane angling in the background and then way in the back in the, the left background is the area where Kettering Hospital is now. But anyway, here are the guests leaving and here they are. Here's the lead car in their caravan exiting out onto Dorothy Lane. So lots of hoops and hollers and shouting and goodbyes and, and uh, horn honking as the guests left this party. Passing underneath, again, we see some Adirondacks uh, influence in that gateway leading out to Dorothy Lane. Going back to this image, uh, we see in the background the waiting station for what was the Hills and Dales Railway. This was established in 1911, back in the heyday of electric railroad transportation. So this was a way to get out from Dayton out to the remote countryside to, uh, for the, to this facility. So the way this worked is you could hop on an electric railroad car in downtown Dayton and then from there, it came down uh, what's now South Dixie to the intersection with Dorothy Lane. 
And from that intersection, it turned and continued eastbound on Dorothy Lane. So this is an aerial photo, a little bit later time frame, uh, showing where the, the electric railroad turned. If you think the golden nugget pancake house, you know where this intersection is. So it came up Dorothy Lane and one stop as shown on this early map of Dorothy Lane was the waiting room for the, what was then the NCR Country Club just to the north. So National Cash Register's Country Club was, was there where we think of as community club uh, being. These are some of the early buildings there at the Country Club. So a, a stop on the electric railroad. If we go out modern day to this fairway on the community golf course, we're looking toward the former site of the waiting room that was there. So we have West Dorothy Lane off to our left and the traffic light at the intersection of Southern Boulevard just out of view to the left. If we go back, making use of our time machine, we have that same view where we see the waiting room for the Hills and Dales Railway there in the background. And then we see one car along lonely West Dorothy Lane. So we, we see that the, um, uh, what was what was called the Berkeley Heights neighborhood is just starting to be developed in this time frame. This is kind of the southern portion of what we now refer to as the Southern Hills neighborhood. If we move over to that area a little more closely, this is West West Dorothy Lane, looking west near Berkeley Street. And so that waiting station stood just um, to the right of center. Um, uh, in this area. And again, if we go back in time, here we see it. So this is early West Dorothy Lane and the electric rail car is coming up the tracks to the waiting room. And there's a couple of wooden platforms for people to board and deboard uh, the rail car to, um, for, uh, for accessing the NCR club. The Hills and Dales Railway continued along West Dorothy Lane to the waiting station at the Automobile Country Club. So here we see the tracks uh, ending at this rail station there at some point was a, a loop for the rail car to turn around. We see some people waiting there at the station. Off to the right is two lane West Dorothy Lane. We're looking uphill. So the Ridgeway Road Bridge would later go, go in uphill. Uh, in the background behind the, the uh, waiting room here. And then on the rise, uh, 1,000 feet or so up on the hill, we see our Dayton Automobile Country Club. Well, by 1912, uh, Hills and Dales Park had grown immensely popular. And here's a newspaper article from uh, mid-October about where we are now mentioning that thousands enjoy nature and changing trees at Hills and Dales. So Hills and Dales was, was drawing enormous crowds of people for recreation. Again, it was about the only place to go to enjoy nature and enjoy a, a walk in the park without having to go way outside of town somewhere. This article mentions last Sunday afternoon, there were hundreds and hundreds of people walking driving horses or automobiling through hills and dales and one observer estimated the number who were being served with tea and cakes or soup and wafers at the halfway house not far from round camp as being almost 100 at one time so a little clearer view here of the halfway house this old farmhouse that stood in hills and dales park you could stop there and grab a snack while you were in Hills and Dales. Here's a modern day view of that area. This is South Patterson Boulevard and Park Road looking to the north. Uh, to the right, we see the parking lot for Hills and Dales Park. This is the area where the pond and the gazebo are. And if you're like me, maybe baby boomer age, you may know that uh, what we called Suicide Hill was kind of off to the left behind us a little bit to get you oriented. But back in the day, uh, this road led to Halfway House. And so a long time ago, the view might have been something like this. If you're hiking through the park modern in modern times, um, you, this fallen tree 
you probably know where we are here. This fallen tree is a popular spot. We see kids climbing around on it, moms and dads taking pictures of the kids on the on the uh, on the tree. Half, well, I'm sorry, halfway house stood right behind that. So we would be looking up at the back of halfway house here a long time ago. This article mentions that halfway house was not far from round camp. Round camp stood high up on the ridge, uh, just again to reference Suicide Hill. That's on sort of a ridge system running through the park and round camp stood to the north of Suicide Hill, just off the, what's now off the beaten path. There's not a whole lot going on up there, but um, um, one of the camp shelters in the park and you see the Adirondack style influence in its design. Round Camp was a very popular destination for horseback riders early on in Hills and Dales Park. It was along one of the main bridle paths. And so we see some people, some horseback riders there at Round Camp up high on the ridge. And it's hard to overstate the popularity of horseback riding during this Ill, early time in Hills and Dales Park. Enormously popular pastime to ride horses so much so that this early map that we see in the legend, Bridal Pass is the, the first entry in the notes. So uh, Olmstead laid out a number of bridal paths through the park, typically following some of the ridges in the area. One of the popular stops for horseback riders was the Auto Club watering trough fed by a spring of pure water. So here we are at the south end of the auto club looking north um, and a, a natural spring flowed down the hillside from the high ground to the east and somebody hollowed out a log trough and sort of stuck it there so the horses would have a, a nice place to stop and, and get a drink. Here's some more horseback riders in Hills and Dales. Tom Watson, a very important figure in early NCR and later president of International Business Machines is shown at the left. Uh, Patterson really liked him early on in NCR's history because Watson would ride horses with Patterson at, at a moment's notice. He could always count on him if he, if he wanted to go out for a ride. 1912 newspaper article talks about saddling grows in popularity in Hills and Dales Park and it featured a picture of John H. Patterson and his daughter Dorothy on horseback. Mr. Patterson, as always, looks very happy in photographs um, where he's with his daughter here. Uh, the, the article mentions Mr. Patterson is mounted on Spinner, an exceedingly fine animal, and Miss Dorothy on her horse, John. Spinner is the horse that's depicted in the Patterson Memorial Monument. Hills and Dales also had polo grounds, part of the area that's now the golf course set aside for polo, which was very popular in the park during these early years. Here's a view of the polo grounds from the automobile club. So the, the clubhouse had this wonderful view of the valley to the west. And we're looking down here at what's now the golf course, the uh, clubhouse buildings, in the middle background, that's the area where the community course, community uh, golf course clubhouse is now. But back in the day, and this uh, the polo grounds were this rectangular flat field in the middle background here. You see a goal line, it looks like a goal at one end. And then back then there was a nine hole golf course that surrounded the polo grounds, mostly to the north. And then it wrapped its way around to the, um, eastern side of the polo grounds. And in this image, we see some golfers at the foot of the hill. Here's more activity out on the polo field. This is a game of push ball. Uh, the ob objective of this was to push this enormous ball across a goal line at either end of the field. A pretty, a pretty rigorous game, um, this, this also called horse soccer. In this image, to get you oriented, we see Round Camp way up at the upper left with a, a wonderful view. 
And then again, uh, I keep referencing Suicide Hill, but I think that's a, a landmark known to many is, is just to the left of center. So we're looking at the, the backside, the golf course side of Suicide Hill. Perhaps the most conspicuous figure on horseback in the park at this time was this man, Captain Huey. He was a mounted patrolman, a former NCR factory worker employed by John H. Patterson. So he patrolled Hills and Dales Park on this enormous horse and made sure everybody minded their business properly in the park. Um, but he also had a soft side. He was something of an ornithologist. He knew all about the birds in Hills and Dales Park. So if you wanted to know something about the birds, you could ask Captain Huey and he would tell you all about them. I think this is him early on uh, feeding the birds or probably the squirrels more most likely at Hills and Dales. Captain Huey was also in charge of the various camps at Hills and Dales. There were nine, uh, sorry, eight camps in the park proper. And then Mr. Patterson also made available his Far Hills camp over on his estate for public use. The way this worked is that the camps at, at Hills and Dales were available for picnics and parties. You would go down to the National Cash Register factory complex to what was called the welfare office put down your rental of a dollar per day and a refundable deposit of 50 cents. And then you could have your party at the camp if you cleaned up everything uh, and put it away. After Captain Huey inspected the camp shelter, then you would get your deposit back. Here's an early view of the Adirondack camp that's over in Hills and Dales Park, one of the more popular campsites there. A Collier's Magazine article in 1914 talked about these camps and said these camps each contain rough cooking utensils, a complete set of dishes, a locker filled with potatoes, plenty of salt and pepper, and water both for drinking and washing the dishes. In this image, we see a drinking water vessel off to the right, uh, off to the right. And then around one side of the, the shelter would be a large barrel with water for washing the dishes. There are signs indicating just where everything is to be found. We see signs inside the shelter and complete directions for baking the potatoes in the hot sand and ashes in the fireplace. The cooking outfit even includes wooden forks for toasting marshmallows. These were designed by John H. Patterson himself. In fact, he gave his personal attention to all of the details of the camp equipment. Here's another view of round camp early on, a beautiful glass lantern slide, sort of a, a precursor to 35 millimeter film slides, uh, probably taken right after round camp was constructed. It looks like it's in, in pretty good shape. This is one that did not have that lean-to style design, but it was was round, but obviously the Adirondack rustic look to it here. Here's some people picnicking at round camp. By then, looks like there was some chicken wire set up and uh, maybe morning glories or moonflowers growing on that chicken wire. We see smoke coming out of the fireplace behind the camp, so there's there's a fire. And it looks like maybe these ladies are having to, in the foreground, are having to do all the cooking while everybody else is kind of sitting around talking there in the background. The society columns in the newspaper back in the early 20th century were chock full of accounts of meetings, picnics, and parties at uh, Hills and Dales at these camp shelters. For example, round camp number three, it looks like they must have had specific numbers back then. At Hills and Dales was a scene of a happy gathering on Sunday when Mr. and Mrs. Bailey of the NCR entertained a merry crowd of friends. One of the features of the day was a running match. Tired but happy, all left at a late hour. And then these typically go on to tell you who was there. In this case, Walter Crager was there. He was an important figure in uh, Oakwood's early government. Here's a nice view of round camp in the winter up on the ridge. 
And going back to Adirondack camp, here's some picnickers there. Looks like they're setting up some food and somebody is crouched down at the little fire pit there. So here's a close up of one of the fire pits in Hills and Dales. There's a little um, structure there. It looks like somebody has taken a wire coat hanger and fashioned that into a hook so that you could heat up uh, maybe in your tin cup some, some soup or some coffee or boil some water for some tea over the fire. Here's another view of, of Adirondack Camp along Patterson Boulevard. So this camp, this, this picture was taken just upslope from where the Patterson Monument would later be. And if we go back in time, or sorry, through time, we see that the wooden camp shelter was replaced with this brick and stone shelter that uh, it should be familiar to you if you, if you hike the Adirondack Trail through Hills and Dales Park. This is Inspiration Point Camp. This was built, I think, a little later, maybe World War I-ish time frame. Note it has a little bit more modern design, not so rustic, a little more modern looking roof and uh, glass windows here. Mr. and Mrs. Johnson gave a unique Halloween party Friday evening at Inspiration Camp in Hills and Dales entertaining a company of friends in celebration of their first wedding anniversary and also in honor of this new bride and groom. Jack-o'-lanterns and weird Halloween symbols were everywhere in evidence. A luncheon in keeping with the night was served. The NBB Club enjoying a weed roast at Inspiration Camp Wednesday evening with a comedy sketch by Nip Clark and John Schaefer, who have accepted contracts with a vaudeville circuit. If you want to know where Inspiration Point Camp got its name, check out the beautiful view to the north. These camp shelters were typically situated on high ground with, with uh, scenic views, and I think this one must have been particularly uh, spectacular. If you have ever been hiking in Hills and Dales Park right off of Oak Knoll in West Oakwood and seen this old fireplace, stone fireplace and chimney, you are looking at what stood in the center of Inspiration Point Camp. So we see the top of the chimney just peeking out of the top of the structure and we can see where the roof line was in this modern day shot. So this is all grown up with uh, with trees and then there's, there's houses nearby. So a very different view in the woods there now. Headed south, this is Locust Camp. Note that it has kind of a similar architectural style. We see a more modern looking roof. We have windows in this one, some ladies enjoying themselves at Locust Camp. Here's a little broader view of Locust Camp. This stood to the south of Dorothy Lane and had a wonderful view up on the ridge of the valley to the west. So uh, at that site, uh, we would be looking down at where Kettering Hospital is now. And um, um, so we're looking to the north here. Locust Camp stood near the modern day intersection of Big Hill Road and the street in Kettering, the road in Kettering called Locust Camp obviously named after this camp shelter. So uh, this is all a uh, suburban plat there now south of, of the, the Ridgeway Road Bridge. So Ridgeway, Ridgeway Road would be off to our right, just down slope a little bit. I think possibly the buildings in the background at the left, sorry, at the right um, are, are in the area just south of the Ridgeway Road Bridge. That might be Dorothy Patterson's house there in the background. Big Hill Camp is shown here. It had this lean-to style design. We have the fireplace and the chimney in the back. This stood in the area behind where Kettering Hospital is now. So if you've ever driven big on Big Hill Road behind the hospital, you know that uh, there are some houses at the top of a very big hill that leads down toward Tate Road. And so this Camp shelter stood at the top of the hill there, would have had, again, a spectacular view off to the west. 
uh, we see in the, the lower left, we see just a glimpse of what's now South Dixie um, Highway down at the foot of the hill. So I'll take a break here for just a moment and see if we have any questions. Brian, do we have a question or two? So um, I don't have any in the chat, but um, we did have a hand raised earlier. So if there's a question, um, please use the chat and type that in. Or um, there is a Q&A feature, you can use that. If you take your cursor to the bottom of your screen, you should get that functionality. We'll give you just a moment in case there are any questions. So they're either long questions or they're not typing anything <laughs> yet. So um, okay. So we do have one in. Um, Gary's wondering if Dorothy's house is still there. Yes, uh, there's an early house just to the south of the uh, Ridgeway Road Bridge. There's one that stands out as being considerably older, and I believe Dorothy Patterson lived there at least for a short time. Mm -hmm. But I think she did not like living out so far away from town, so I believe it was is only it was only a, a moment that she lived there. Okay. Um, Tina's wondering if Dorothy brought the squirrels, uh, the white squirrels, to, uh, to Kenry. Ah, uh, I haven't heard anything about that. Okay. Um, what was Hillsdale Shopping Center? Where was it? Okay, so that was um, uh, near the intersection that I had in the earlier slide at uh, West Dorothy Lane and South Dixie. So it stood, let's see, that would be the, uh, I believe the southeast corner of that intersection. And now there are things like uh, office buildings there at the former Hills and Dales Shopping Center. It's just in the area where Kettering recently built a new firehouse there on West Dorothy Lane. So the shopping center stood in the area behind where the firehouse is now. Um, so Annie's wondering where Deed's house is now. Was that owned by Patterson before? No, there was a farm there that Deed's purchased from a, 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 a landholder, a farmer, and I, I don't recall the name, but Moraine Farm um, was not part of, of Patterson's early property. Moraine Farm uh, stands near where Mr. Kettering's Ridgely Terrace was. Kettering and Deeds, of course, uh, good friends and colleagues, and they purchased land together about the same time there, but that was just outside of the boundary of Patterson's land holdings. Um, Anne Marie's asking, says there's a sign off Oak Knoll at the bottom of Inspiration Point that reads Old Barn Camp. There's another chimney there. What was that? That was a camp shelter that was that, as far as I know, um, came into use in later years. I don't believe that was among the various earliest, very earliest camp shelters in Hills and Dales, but it stood just north of where the old barn club used to stand. And so that that camp area was kind of named for the clubhouse. Okay. Marquette is wondering what about the old tower in Hills and Dale. We'll get to that. Um, Jack is wondering, was gravel mined on or near Hills and Dales? There were some small excavations. There were areas that um, uh, maybe gravel was, was taken in small amounts. You do see uh, borrow pits, as they're called, where, where gravel obviously was was excavated. Uh, Olmsteads frowned on that because they thought it, it destroyed the, uh, altered the natural beauty of the landscape. And so I think much of the gravel for improvements was actually brought in. Okay, so we'll take two more questions. Okay. Um, trying to imagine where the car clubhouse would be located today. Can you help? 
Yes, it's what's now on private property. Um, I think you may get a better picture of it as as we as we proceed. But it was it's now on uh, land that was uh, sold and subdivided, and so there's 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 a home standing there now there now. But it's on a rise of, of land just to the north northeast of the intersection of Patterson and Dorothy. And one last one. Who lived in the large house on Stucker Road? Um, Tina said she'd heard that it was a Patterson. On which road? Stucker? Um, not clear to me, I'm afraid. Yeah, maybe we can follow up with that later. There were certainly many, many members of the Patterson family kind of scattered throughout the area. Okay, so we'll go ahead and have David continue, but we'll take more questions at the end, okay? Yes. Okay, moving forward. In 1913, the Automobile Country Club was turned into the NCR Girls Club. Here are some ladies out on the lawn of the NCR Girls Club, perhaps not fully following flag etiquette here, but uh, obviously enjoying themselves. An NCR publication stated that girl employees of the National Cash Register Company are being given exclusive privileges of the clubhouse and grounds. So Mr. Patterson was um, a very benevolent employer in many ways, and he um, had many women working for him. And so he, for those who didn't live, who didn't have relatives to live with, here in the city, he made arrangements for uh, places for them to live. And this may, may have been part of that effort. They, he did certainly put them up at the um, Patterson homestead and had a, a stable there made into a, a dormitory for them. By this time frame, Patterson's eventual land holdings in Hills and Dales looked like this. So in this early map, we see Dorothy Lane running east to west toward the center. And then you can see Patterson's land holdings to the south of Dor Dorothy Lane were quite extensive. And they ranged all the way over there to the southwest uh, along Dixie Highway, just north of the Patterson and Deeds property that we were talking about a moment ago. So this is kind of back into that Huber development there. Um, off of uh, South Dixie, it ranged, the, the southern boundary ran to the south of Winding Way Road that we see shown toward the, the lower right portion of the map. And then the, the eastern boundary went out all the way to Lebanon Pike in the area across from where the uh, Kettering Fire Station is there near the library. Um, the western boundary, much of the western boundary to the west of Southern Boulevard kind of skirted the edge of the Southern Hills neighborhood. The eastern boundary, much of it to the west of Lebanon Pike, encompassing that whole ridge system that was so scenic back then and from which Ridge Way Road is named. So that was part of the park, Ridge Way Road. And part of the northern boundary extending into the area that's now Dayton Country Club grounds. So to give you a, a modern day perspective, this is the this is the, that same boundary on a satellite view. So the park included this enormous suburban area to the south of Dorothy Lane, uh, included the, the present day golf course. And then Hills and Dales Park, as we know it now, trends in an arcuate pattern to the north of the golf course and then toward the southeast uh, bordering what we think of as West Oakwood. This map was drafted about 1914 and identifies the clubhouse as the NCR Girls Club. This map is a little tricky to look at because it's oriented with east in the up direction, but I want to zoom into that clubhouse area. Whoops and rotate uh, a detail of the map to orient it with north in the up direction. So we're looking down at that L-shaped NCR Girls Club. Um, Patterson actually had Dorothy, the route of Dorothy Lane altered slightly. Instead of a straight shot, he had a little bit of curvature 
introduced to give it a more pastoral feel. So this map is showing Dorothy Lane running east to west, traced in the green. This was later straightened out a little more when the Ridgeway Road uh, bridge was built, but this is what it looked like in the early days. And then in 1907, Olmsteads planned a small road to connect the clubhouse area from Dorothy Lane. So if you hold on to your hats while we go into the modern world, looking down at that same area, uh, we see a little ghost of that access road that still exists as this abandoned turnoff from West Dorothy Lane. So to get you oriented to this image, uh, we have the Ridgeway Road bridge up to the um, to the right, uh, coming downhill toward the intersection with Big Hill, that little road um, stands right across the street. And then more to the west, we have Patterson Boulevard coming in from the north. Um, Winding Way Road is to the south of that intersection. And then we see Pondway coming in and meeting Winding Way Road. So Pondway was named for a few fishing ponds that stood there that Olmsteads uh, planned and had built for, for fishing back in the early days. Anyway, um, the road still stands there. And so this is all private property now. So um, uh, keep that in mind. But if you've ever been driving down uh, West Dorothy Lane in the vicinity of Big Hill and wondered why there's an old turnoff that basically leads to nowhere that was a former road to the clubhouse that was abandoned about 90 years ago, but back in the day would have led to uh, our wonderful clubhouse. Again, this leads back to private property now. 1915 marked the beginning of Sunday afternoon concerts at the clubhouse. This is a look at the kind of the natural amphitheater that was formed by the curving hillside behind the clubhouse. So in this picture, we see, looks like a lady playing piano on the stage to the right. We see her audience on the hillside. In the center of the image, we see a movie projection booth. And so they would have, uh, when the sun went down, they would have put a, a screen or a sheet on the stage to show motion pictures. And if you kind of squint your eyes a little bit, we just catch a little glimpse of Dorothy Lane in the background, kind of coming up the hill to the right of center. In 1915, the clubhouse was renamed the Hills and Dales Club. And so this was Mr. Patterson's effort to make a, establish a, a, a country club that was accessible to everybody instead of having to pay enormous fees for membership and for yearly renewal of membership, uh, you could join the Hills and Dales Club. This newspaper article when it was open says, club memberships are open to all persons of good character, the rates being $1 per year. 10 cents per day is charged for each guest or for children. Luncheons and dinners are served daily and an atmosphere of quiet, Comfort and suburban beauty makes the club a spot where all may congregate for pleasure and rest. So you can come out to the countryside and have some fresh air and a bite to eat and uh, engage in some activities at the Hills and Dales Club. This was open seasonally from about Memorial Day into October or so, maybe about this time of year or about the first snowfall. Uh, to accommodate people riding horseback in the park. The seasonal opening in May of 1916 talked about the Hills and Dales Club, showed some photographs of the clubhouse and grounds, and in the area highlighted off to the, the right in the, the left in the yellow, it, it talks about the advantages. So the advantages of the Hills and Dales Club included country air, Tennis, dancing, dinner parties, club meeting place, tea corner, picnics, musicals, Sunday afternoon choir service, current topic talks, croquet, five cent electric rail car service continued from downtown Dayton, excursions, dining pavilion, 
women may stay overnight, special entertainments, and a free sunset. And I think we've come full circle because you may know in our modern times, while we're being locked down, a, a kind of simple thing that people enjoy is driving over to the foot of Oak Knoll uh, nearby where the clubhouse stood and going out and sitting on the edge of the golf course and watching the sunset over the, over the landfill that's to the west of town. A newspaper article in 1916 talked about the Hills and Dales Club from the perspective of a young lady. It was a radiantly beautiful summer night that some of us girls picked for our wonderful adventure at the Hills and Dales Club. We went out early in the afternoon and sought the shade and calm of the trees, which make the place so unusually attractive to those of us who have been accustomed to the heat and dust of the city. Well, we were all in fine spirits by five o'clock, enjoying every minute of the day. We saw the great red orb of the day go down behind the western hills, saw the daylight die, as the poet would say, and as night grew on apace, the dinner bell called us to one of the finest little dinners I have ever enjoyed. The night had come and we went out of doors, out under the open sky with the great canopy of heaven, dotted with the millions of stars as a covering to the earth. The crickets sang their evening song and the quiet of the evening enwrapped us. We all sat up until away after 10 o'clock, just looking at the big world wrapped in darkness and mystery. How I should have loved to watch the whole night through. It was all so wonderful. And the night wore on and finally we surrendered to the passion for sleep and retired. The night then was all too short, and before we knew it, the sunbeams were rushing through the windows of our sleeping room, and we welcomed the new day. It was so beautiful, so restful, so like the life I always thought I wanted to live, that I count the hours that must pass before I visit the club again. In 1917, John H. Patterson donated the NCR Country Club to the city of Dayton for use as a community country club. So the area that we know of now as the community golf course was the NCR Country Club and then later a new facility called NCR Country Club built, built to the south of town. We are looking at the lay of the land there at the early uh, country club. We have some old buildings, a, a men's and women's clubhouse and they actually flew airplanes there. Um, there was an airplane hangar kind of in the, the center. The, one of the old farmhouses is, is visible in red in the background. That was the O'Neill farmhouse. All of this in the area where the, actually where the parking lot is now for the community club. So plans were worked out for this. So it gave the citizens of Dayton a, a place uh, to, to go for golfing and for um, other types of, of outdoor entertainment. For example, here's a children's playground at the community club. We have some, some kids on teeter-totters and swings enjoying themselves. Uh, here is the sandbox, so little girls in their clean white dresses playing in the sandbox here. The following year, Mr. Patterson donated 294 acres in the heart of Hills and Dales Park to the city of Dayton for use as a public park. So the, the boundaries of what we think of as Hills and Dales Park nowadays was donated in this 1918 timeframe. Uh, a big dedication ceremony was planned that spanned the entire weekend. And this was a, 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 a very welcome event for people. Again, uh, lots of people coming to Hills and Dales and appreciating a place to go and, uh, and hike and, and be in the outdoors. So an estimated 20,000 people attended the dedication ceremony. Here is part of that. We have some, yo some young people out on the polo field. And to get you oriented here in the left background, we have the, the wooded area uh, along where Addy Rondack Trail is. There's a big white water tower. There's a couple of camp shelters in there. Uh, and then just to the right of that is the open area where the Patterson Memorial Monument 
would be in future years. So in that, that center background, there was a dedication ceremony for uh, a, 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 a sort of a, a speaker's platform was set up for part of the dedication ceremony. So um, that's shown in the background here. We have a, a crowd of people for that. Um, if I understand correctly, Mr. Patterson had fallen off a horse just recently. And so he sat this one out while he recovered, but his daughter Dorothy spoke in his stead at this dedication ceremony. Here she is pictured in the oval in this newspaper clipping. So she spoke, some other, other dignitaries attended. I think government people spoke. It even brought out the reclusive Oroville Wright who's shown in the uh, above Dorothy in that newspaper clipping. He has his, his um, hat over his heart and there's a couple military guys saluting. So this may have been during the uh, playing of the national anthem at this dedication ceremony. The following month in July of 1918, uh, the, there was a dinner and dance for soldiers held at the Hills and Dales Club. The newspaper article talks that this, uh, the soldiers were guests of Mrs. She was then Dorothy Patterson Judah, uh, uh, a misnomer there in the, the, the title. It was actually Hills and Dales rather than at the Far Hills. But the NCR trucks were dispatched to McCook Field and to Wright Field during the waning months of World War I and brought in all these soldiers for this dinner and dance. Here they are posing for a photograph out in front of the clubhouse. And then uh, here, here we see, by then John H. had recovered. He is uh, shown here again, beaming with his daughter Dorothy in, uh, in, in July of 1918. He's dressed in a nice summer linen suit with his straw hat in his right hand. Keep that in mind for a moment. Here are the soldiers being fed dinner behind the Hills and Dales Club. So looks like we have a beautiful sunset off to the west in the background. In the, the, the middle background, we see the barn side of our clubhouse. There's a skylight cut in the ceiling for that. And then over to the right, we have the old farmhouse, a beautiful, good sized two story farmhouse with a couple of dormers up on the third level. So the soldiers are being fed and then they danced. Here they are on a dance pavilion um, uh, behind the clubhouse or sort of next to it. Here we have Mr. Patterson looking on. He is holding on to the railing just to the lower left of, of center. And he still has a straw hat in his white hand. So a photographer ran up to the second floor and snapped this picture of the dancing. A much larger party was held the following year when Mr. Patterson shut down the National Cash Register factory for a day on a Saturday for the National Cash Register Field Day. So all 6,000 or so National Cash Register employees formed a parade and marched from the factory complex coming down uh, Far Hills Avenue here. We see the old building 10, the office building in the background. So they're marching. Uh, we see the crossing gates for the steam railroad that crossed there about in the area where Caldwell Avenue or Caldwell Road is. Uh, coming southbound, they paraded into Oakwood at the Five Points intersection where where um, Far Hills, Oakwood Avenue, East and, and Thruston come together. They made a right turn, came through West Oakwood and streamed out onto the golf course here for the National Cash Register Field Day. So here they are coming in from the West Oakwood area, a big line of, of employees, trucks and the electric railroads were dispatched to pick up their family members and so there was something on the order of 25,000 people, NCR factory employees and their families out on the golf course area for this enormous party. Here we have the beverages being set up. We have people waiting off to the, off to the left, the beverages being set up. In the background, we have a, a commissary where the, the cooking was done. And here they are being served. 
their food and their beverages. So we're out on the golf course area, the, the clubhouse buildings are visible there in the left background. The newspaper article, the newspapers were, were full of accounts of this event. Uh, the provisions, one 3000 gallon water tank, two 800 gallon coffee vats, three 380 gallon cauldrons, maybe for soup, 2,500 gallon steam kettles, 110 cooks, 650 servers, 80 serving stands. Both lunch and dinner were served at the field day, 30,000 meals at each one, 8,000 pounds of beef, 91,000 sandwiches, 10,000 gallons of lemonade, 1,800 gallons of ice cream, 50,000 packages of crackers, and 3,000 pounds of candy. So after they were fed lunch, then everybody was entertained. So we see off to the left of the, the food area, we have kind of a carnival type setup. We have in the background um, tents and, and platforms and stages for entertainment. And then in the foreground, we have um, a marching band out on the running track. So the entertainment consists of things like side sideshows, games, prizes, parades, clown, clowns, fireworks, fortune tellers, motion pictures, singing, band concerts, dancing, sporting contests, a polo match, and a baseball game between teams from Stivers and Steel High Schools, shown here with the audience looking on. This enormous party, all on Mr. Patterson's dime, $50,000 cost in 1919 money, which equates to however many hundreds of thousands of dollars in today's money. Mr. Patterson is shown here, he was uh, just on the eve of his 75th birthday, but he made the parade from NCR out to this party. And here he is visiting with some of the family members of some of his employees. There was, there was a waiting room, uh, a waiting pool, excuse me, at the community club. Here's some kids splashing in the waiting pool and part of the festivities at the NCR field day the losers in the tug of war contest are shown here in the waiting pool as they were dragged through by the victors. So if you kind of look in the left center, we see the victors all dug in and then their, their, their uh, colleagues are getting wet in the waiting pool. Here's a women's tug of war contest. So the, the women are staying dry out on this running track. Um, on the golf course area and, and a, 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 some people looking on there. This is an interesting photograph because we see uh, West Dorothy Lane in the background. We see the open area to the south and you just can catch a glimpse up on the open area of the ridge to the left of center, a uh, little, little view of Locust Camp sticking up there. So this would have had a, a great view from up on that ridge. In 1919, the Hills and Dales Club was renamed the Old Barn Club, and things pretty much stayed the same with the arrangements, to, just that the name was changed. A newspaper article in 1922 talks about the, the seasonal opening and lists who the, the board of directors were. So the Old Barn Club was, was run by the uh, the, the chair of the board of directors was this woman shown in the newspaper photograph with the little girl. Uh, that was Hattie Schaefer. Uh, she was the wife of the developer, developer Walter Schaefer, who built um, many of the houses in East Oakwood. So she was the chair. And then her board of directors were the ladies shown in the photograph at the lower left. So they were all in charge of things like membership, Sunday afternoon concerts, literary teas, Saturday and Tuesday evening dances, entertainment and informal Saturday afternoon talks. And those talks were arranged by Charlotte Reeve Conover, the woman pictured at the lower um, right. She wrote many uh, indispensable books about Dayton's early history, a prolific author. She was a good friend of John H. Patterson, and she wrote 
a biography of him after his passing. And she also wrote some books about his and his wife's family background. Um, mainly, uh, Mr. Patterson wanted to have that documented for his children. So a, a prolific author. During this time frame, the concerts continued at this at the old barn club in this this natural amphitheater behind the clubhouse. Here's another view that we're oriented differently. We have our back to West Dorothy Lane. In this image, we see some performers on stage. Um, Patterson Boulevard would be coming in about 100 yards to our left out of this image. We catch just a glimpse of the background of the, the back side of the clubhouse in the back left background of the photo. We see our audience, we see the movie projection booth, and then the dance pavilion in the uh, kind of the middle and right background of that picture. These concerts were enormously popular. The um, Dayton Daily News would print programs for the concert, so you could clip them ahead of time, bring them out to the concert with you, and enjoy a, a musical performance out in the out of doors. The newspaper at the close of the season in 1920 talked, reported on the success of these um, concerts. It, it mentions the average attendance at the concerts was between six and 700, although on one Sunday there were 1,500 present and on another 1,200. So enormously popular, so much so that they even continued them during the winter down at downtown at places like um, Memorial Hall. I think that was the, the main venue. It was in this early 1920s time frame that the Old Barn Club really hit its stride in popularity. Um, these are some examples of, of newspaper articles. The history of the Old Barn Club, as interesting as it is brilliant, uh, average attendance now running above 1,000 each week. The fame of the old barn club extends over this entire country. In 1921, stables were established for horseback riding at the old barn club. The, the first manager was a guy named Fred Tehan, who was a, um, a, a former rodeo star. But in 1922, the man shown at the left, King Tullus, took over management of the stable. So here he is out at the uh, out in the front of the stables. King Tullus has his, his, his signature riding vest on. That was kind of a, a trademark of his. And he taught countless children in the Oakwood and Van Buren Township area equestrianship. He was enormously popular. Here is a clipping from an NCR publication at the onset of his um, time there at the stables. Children's Riding Club is formed to give the children of Dayton an opportunity of participating in healthy exercise of horseback riding. A children's riding club was recently formed at the Old Barn Club stables. So you could come and uh, talk to King Tullus. He's shown in the hat mounted on the horse at the left side of that inset image and ride horses with him. Here's a, another picture of him on horseback. He's at the, at the right with some kids, a group of Dayton Country Club riders with King Tullis on the trails around the golf course at Hills and Dales. So he had a presence at sort of two stables at once. One was the old barn club. Also over at Dayton Country Club, they had some stables that stood where the very large parking lot is now. So he was managing both stables. I've had the pleasure of meeting a couple of women um, who rode horses with King Tullus and everything I've heard about him or read about him said that he was just a wonderful man and taught you how to ride horses and how to have adventures in the out of doors on them and how not to be afraid of them and how to handle them. So it, it must have been great fun to ride horses with King Tullus. A newspaper article from 1922 talks about the old barn club from the perspective of a horseback rider. Uh, we were out riding the other morning and stopped in at the old barn club about noon, riding clothes and all. 
we asked if it were possible to get lunch and found we could be served if we would wait just a little while. Of course, you should telephone ahead and make reservations, but this is what we had. Delicious clear bouillon, a half fried chicken, spaghetti with cheese, new peas, plates of little biscuits and raspberry jam, a salad of cucumber and pineapple in gelatin and homemade ice cream with chunks of peaches in it and cake. These were some well-fed horseback riders. It was served in a delightfully cool green, white and black dining room with bowls of berries for table decorations. It sounds wonderful. In March of 1922, John H. Patterson praised the work of the Old Barn Club. The Old Barn Club is like a flower half blown, old poetic term there, said John H. Patterson Friday evening at Far Hills when he entertained the members of the board of directors of the club at dinner and discussed with them plans for the coming summer. I hope that we may live to see it unfolded for I feel that it will grow more and more beautiful each year. And unfortunately, less than two months after saying that, Mr. Patterson passed on. He had a heart attack while he was riding a train outside of Philadelphia. And I think with him went much of kind of the early spirit of Hills and Dales Park. Times were, were starting to change then. He bequeathed to his children most of his estate, which included all of this land um, that outside of what, in Hills and Dales Park, outside of what he had donated to the city. And part of that land was the 16 acre tract of land in Hills and Dales where the old barn club was situated. By this time, the uh, oak wood was growing to the south and uh, this land around the park was becoming quite valuable, very desirable. And so here is an aerial photograph. We are just above the old barn club looking to the uh, east. And we see kind of in the middle background, Ridgeway Road is cross cutting, uh, running north to south, your left to right. And a couple of the Tudor houses that stand on Ridgeway Road just between Oak Knoll and the Ridgeway Road Bridge off to our right are shown here. So this was some of the earliest land uh, that, that was sold for, for uh, development for private property. Um, it's an interesting image. We see Lebanon Pike running in the background. This is present day Far Hills. Oak Knoll is the street that's, that's truncated in the uh, background. So Dorothy Lane Market, modern day landmark, stands just in that area to the um, right of the, the background center. So we have Oak Knoll coming up to the west. We have those early Tudors to the south. And then Oak Knoll comes up and winds around our uh, our chimney and fireplace for Inspiration Point Camp. So we see the, the road looping around. By this time, the, the camp shelter was gone. You may be able just to make out the, the circular footprint of it around the, the chimney, but it had been moved to another place in the park. Um, but you see that the, that was still kind of wide open uh, area, still, of course, part of Hills and Dales Park. After Mr. Patterson's passing, grateful NCR employees in the city of Dayton planned a memorial monument to him and raised the necessary $92,000 for its development. They hired the sculptor shown in the lower portion of the figure here to sculpt the uh, sculpture of Mr. Patterson on spinner. So there it is in the sculptor's studio. And then it was put together maybe late 1927, early 1928. Here we show a photograph of the sculpture being lowered onto the, to the monument. There was a, a small ceremony where a time capsule was placed in the base of the memorial. Maybe not so much a time capsule, but a box with uh, biographical information about Mr. Patterson. Was, was placed in the monument and is presumably still there in the base. A much larger dedication ceremony occurred in May 
1928 at an official dedication. Here we see people out on the what's what's now and was then the golf course for this ceremony. Of course, the memorial monument on the hill at the right background, and then at the base of the hill we have a a, uh, a platform with people speaking and, and loudspeakers, so that can be um, heard by all at this this dedication ceremony. Here, of course, is the monument present day and a look at it back about the time that it was first dedicated there on, on Patterson Boulevard. Well, by this time frame, the old barn club was no longer the remote country destination that it used to be. It stood in the area about where the arrow is pointing and you can see that things are growing in, uh, in the Oakwood area. So to get you oriented to this picture, of course, we see the Miami River in the background, uh, downtown Dayton to the, to the right of, of the background center. Coming to the south, we have the Oval Track at the Montgomery County Fairgrounds, and then some of the National Cash Register buildings are visible just net, right in that same vicinity. Coming southbound, we see kind of in the main uh, central portion, that's East Oakwood that's growing to the south, approaching modern day Dorothy Lane, uh, which actually hadn't been cut through between um, Far Hills and Schroyer. The little last bit of that wasn't cut through until the early uh, 1930s. So to traverse what we think of as Dorothy Lane now, you actually had to go down East Drive in Oakwood to make the connection from east to west. Um, you see kind of in the foreground that much of what was then Van Buren Township is still undeveloped. So that's still pretty rural farmland. And then to the lower left of the image, I believe that's Stroop Road. So looks like uh, in the lower left area, some of the, the, the housing plats just north of Town and Country Shopping Center um, have been, are, are being at least laid out there. Anyway, the point is, is that uh, uh, things were changing. This wasn't out in the countryside anymore. Many of the activities that had been held at the old barn club, the dinners and the dances had been shifted over to the East Oakwood Club. This is now the present day OCC, the Oakwood Community Center. Uh, Mr. Patterson had a hand in its construction. Hattie Schaefer uh, chaired its, its operation. Her husband um, uh, was important. And I think he built the structure or maybe donated the land that it's on. So the, Things were shifting over to the, the East Oakwood Club as far as social gatherings. And the OCC was, or the, the uh, East Oakwood Club, open year round. So it wasn't, you weren't limited to just seasonal gatherings there. By this time, there were many places to go to get a bite to eat. Here are some of the early restaurants in the Oakwood area along Far Hills, Mills Tavern, and the Coffee Pot Restaurant, ads for them. And by this time, people weren't limited to riding the elect electric railroads to the destinations that they wanted to go. They had much more latitude in traveling. By the end of the, the 1920s was the beginning of the age of the automobile. So automobile production went up, prices went down, cars were more affordable. So uh, by the end of the 1920s, people could, this kind of ushered in the, the a golden age of travel in the US. So it kind of opened up the West and people could go over wherever, go wherever they wanted to for, for entertainment and for uh, re recreation and food. So all of this led to a decline in popularity of the old barn club. This newspaper article says the clubhouse was continued in operation until the past summer when it ceased operations. It was never a money-making proposition, but Mr. Patterson did not aim to make it so and always took, gladly took care of the deficit. So apparently John H. Patterson kind of subsidized the operation of the old barn club. And maybe by this time, I don't know if his children continued that, but maybe by this time, 10 years after his passing and with the, the waning in popularity, um, they may have pulled the plug on that. 
So the Schartzer Wrecking and Excavation Company came in, they had a sale of the furniture and the fixtures at the old barn club. And when that was done, then they raised the building, they tore it down. The following year, the old barn club spring was dedicated. This stone structure stood at the site of the horse watering trough. So this natural spring diverted into this, um, this structure. We see a man taking a sip of water from the drinking fountain side. And then on the back side, there was a horse watering trough. And so we see some people on horseback. And in the, the center of the image, we see the, the water coming out with the man on horseback there. That man is Captain Huey. He's still patrolling Hills and Dales Park. So we see him in the hat uh, closest to the, to the old barn club spring. If you look very carefully, you can see some cars coming down the hill behind Captain Huey. They're coming down West Dorothy Lane in the area that would later later be um, regraded to, to take out some of the, the, actually reduce the size of the hill uh, when the, the bridge was built, kind of 1960 or so time frame. And we see in the background behind the horseback riders that the, the barn club itself has been gone. Um, the image at the upper right shows the dedication of the spring. The man with his hat inside his elbow is John H. Patterson's daughter, uh, excuse me, son, Fred Patterson, and adjacent to him are some officials from Van Buren Township for the dedication ceremony. This structure stood there maybe about 10 years up until the World War II timeframe when it was torn down, when that area was developed. Meanwhile, King Tullus continued to operate the stables, the riding stables at the old barn club. The stables were spared the wrecking ball for the time being. And so he had a verbal agreement with the Pattersons to continue horseback riding. Here we see him again with his signature riding vest and a um, picture of the stables there along Patterson Boulevard. And then we have some women on horseback at the front of the stables um, in a picture dated 1938. He continued operating the old barn club stables until 1940 when the Patterson sold the property. So this was the last parcel of land outside of Hills, of Hills and Dales Park as we know it now, the last parcel to be sold. So that was sold and the um, property uh, subdivided and, and platted for, for housing. Um, so King Tullus uh, had to, to close down the stables there, but he still had a presence over at the uh, Dayton Country Club stables. So he simply took the horses from the old barn club stables, took them over to the Dayton Country Club and continued teaching horseback riding to young people. He operated the King Tullus Riding School up until the early 1960s or so until he finally retired. Again, taught countless young people horseback riding. And the sale of that land pretty much closes the book on the old barn club. And by pretty much, I mean, maybe not quite, because if we turn our attention to a site just a few hundred yards to the north, uh, this old stone tower stands there nearby. And if we go back in time, this is what it looks like after it was soon built. It had this wooden roof over the top, and this may have led to the name Witch's Tower. It looks kind of like a witch hat. In my generation, people referred to it as Frankenstein's Castle, probably as the old Universal monster movies started to be shown on television. A newspaper article from 1941 says, uh, the tower required a year to build, is constructed of stone salvaged by the city from condemned buildings. So it may not be coincidental that the, the tower started to be built right about the time that the land that the old barn club had been sold. It is composed of stone salvaged by the city from condemned buildings. And based on the research that I've done, the only building that I know of that had been torn down recently that had this much of that particular type of stone was the old barn club. And so I, I don't have any absolute proof for this, but I, I have a suspicion that when you are looking at this old stone tower, you may be looking at rock 
that came from the foundation of this building, this wonderful clubhouse that served so well over some decades. This stone tower is, has been the subject of much discussion on, on, on message boards and various other sites. Uh, for example, you can learn more about it if you go to Lori Jean's wonderful Kettering, Van Buren Township, Ohio history site. There's a, a much discussion there. Um, other discussions I've seen, a lot of them are reminiscences of baby boomers going into the tower and doing things that they shouldn't have been doing. The one thing that I've never seen mentioned concerns uh, this woman. This uh, is Millie Bingham. Um, she was a syndicated newspaper columnist. She had a nationally syndicated consumer column called Common Sense with a C. Uh, she also wrote for the Dayton Daily News, a column for many years called Ask Millie B. Uh, so she was an accomplished writer. I happened to be acquainted with Mrs. Bingham when I was a young man. She lived off of uh, Ridgeway Road in Kettering. Uh, but she was, she among her writing accomplishments, she also published this book of stories of suspense for young people called It's a Mystery. It was published by the Whitman Publishing Company in the mid 1960s. This is the front cover of the book at the right here. And this is the back cover of the book. And one of the stories in the book was indeed the tower. And it concerns the suspenseful adventures of Diane and Peg as they strayed from a picnic at a camp shelter in a park nearby their house and explored this, this creepy old tower. And I can tell you, verify from being acquainted with Mrs. Bingham that the tower in Hills and Dales Park did indeed inspire this story. Well, it's time to say goodbye to the Old Barn Club. Before we do, we'll run up to the second floor and take one more look outside the, the south end of Mr. Patterson's wonderful country park. And we'll hop into our automobile and head back out under the Adirondack style gateway and up Dorothy Lane into our modern lives. So in closing, I would like to give special thanks to our wonderful host and moderator, Brian Potts, who is adult services coordinator at Wright Memorial Public Library. Thank you, Brian. Also, my thanks to the Oakwood Historic Historical Society in particular, uh, some of the good friends that I've made through there who have been very supportive of some of my speaking and research, uh, Aaron Wilhoyt, Lee Turbin, Mark Risley, and Tom Morrow. And speaking of Tom, please join us next month for his wonderful presentation, How Oakwood Grew, Plat by Plat. Uh, I've seen a previous version of this and I can attest that it's wonderful. So I hope you'll join us um, in November for that. Finally, another uh, tip of the hat to Lori Jean for her wonderful site on Kettering Van Buren Township, Ohio history. Thank you, Lori Jean, for helping document and preserve South Dayton history. And finally, I appreciate all of you for being here. It's, it's wonderful that you joined us for our trip to the past. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, I want to dive back into some of the chat and uh, questions and comments in the chat, um, give you maybe a chance to catch your breath a little bit. Um, we had an earlier question about whether the Hills and Dale uh, rail car or railway was um, considered interurban. And um, as luck would have it, Tom Morrow, who is an expert on all things transportation wise in Dayton, um, was able to answer that question. So I want to go ahead and read some of that um, in case anyone um, wasn't able to see that part. Um, so, so the Hills and Dales line was the first project built by a small outfit you might have heard of called Dayton Power and Light. It was indeed an in interurban and was associated with the Cincinnati Dayton traction, which ran along what is today the northbound lanes of South Dixie Drive. Um, the operation around, along Dorothy Lane and Southern Hills continued until 1932, 
where that portion was cut off at a Y at Dorothy Lane and South Dixie. So a little bit more information there. We had another question about um, when the railway was removed and um, Tom said he wasn't sure when the rails were pulled, um, but he believes that the westbound lanes of Dorothy Lane are on top of what would have been that right of way. Hmm. Um, so the, I'm assuming the rails have been pulled. Uh, he says, as soon as the rails have been pulled um, by World War II, um, and then that line associated with South Dixie last ran in September, uh, September 27th, 1941. So a little bit more information there. Um, go ahead and see what else we have question wise. Um, and do you want to try to show yourself video wise? Yeah. Can you refresh me on that? Sure. If you just hover over your name and bring up the blue and the, the three dots, ah. I'll show myself too. Okay. So you guys can see us now. <laughs> um, so, uh, Question about um, how did the Spanish flu pandemic impact attendance at Hills and Dales in the 1918-1919 time? Do you have any knowledge I, of that? I don't recall seeing any information um, about that. Uh, one, one side note is that over in the, um, a, the 18th whole area of the community golf course is a wonderful memorial to those that were lost during Dayton area uh, uh, soldiers that were lost during World War I. Uh, Victory Oak Knoll is a, is a wonderful place, a little off the beaten path uh, there near the clubhouse for the community, the community club. There is a tablet in honor of the 180 odd people that, it does, that died as a result of World War I. And from what I understand, it was something on the order of 85 of them were died as a result of the Spanish flu. Um, it's a, a, a new um, um, informational sign has been put up over there. So be sure to check that out. It's a wonderful part of local history, but that's about the only thing associated with Hillsendales Park that I can tell you about the Spanish flu, I'm afraid. Okay, um, and I want to read this from Tim Patterson because I don't think it uh, appears for everyone in the chat. Um, he says, my father, Tom Patterson, and his two brothers, Robert and William, were taken up to see the statue of John H. on Spinner that had been installed where it is now. When asked what it was, they all agreed it was Spinner. When asked who was on Spinner, they all agreed it was Rickman, who was John H.'s groom and known to the boys as the person most often seen by them on spinner. Oh my goodness. Let me scroll through here and come up with a couple more. So Pat says there are a number of paved paths in the Northern portion of Hills and Dales Park. Do you know what they were used for? A number of what? Oh yes, those are the those are the early roads in the in the the park. So um, Patterson Boulevard, as we know it now, I don't think was was cut through until maybe the 1930s or so. And so those those paved paths are remnants, the little asphalt paths of the very early roads in hills and dales, as uh, um, shown on some of the early maps. And so. Those when you're walking on that old asphalt, you're 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 trotting upon paths that many horses and uh, horse-drawn carriages and Model Ts would have been driving over back in the very earliest days of the park. So the arrangements of the roads have been changed quite a bit over the years. Okay, and I know you covered this in the presentation, but Daniel was wondering. Maybe you can just go over it again briefly. When did the area become more developed, um, more homes and the golf clubs? Well, it was in the, that kind of mid 1920s time frame that the that uh, the houses, some of the more valuable property, had been sold off, and then I think it was was through the the 1930s and mostly 
and then in the early 1940s, I think was the the last parcel where the old barn club was stood was sold about 1940. So it was all of that time frame that the land was sold off, and then development occurred, um, you know, afterwards, and you kind of get an idea from looking at the um, age of the houses when they were actually built. But again, uh, Tom Morrow's presentation talks a lot about the history of the development in the in the Oakwood portion of uh, what had been Hills and Dales Park. Okay, and, and Lori says, um, concerning the stone for the tower, her understanding was that it also came from buildings downtown. Oh. And she also says, thank you for the mention. Uh, uh, wonderful to have you, Lori Jean. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not certain, certain about the origin, um, uh, but that certainly sounds plausible. One other possible source was at the Runnymede Mansion over in West Oakwood uh, in the area where Catherine Terrace is, was torn down in the mid 1930s also. And so there might've been stone that came from there. I like, I like the idea that at least some of the old barn club stone worked its way into the tower. I like that idea too. Um, so I think Jack has a note here. Note that the era of John Patterson's benevolence was during the rise of the progressive movement and at a time when there were no income taxes, which gave John both the motivation and means for his gener generosity. He had his ways. Uh, he could be a little ruthless with some of his business executives, but he also obviously had a very benevolent uh, side to him, especially for the, the workers in his factory. So you're getting a lot of thank yous and good jobs. Thank you. <laughs> um, Annie says, my three times great grandfather was Adam Schmidt. A Taylor and Dayton. Any relation? Oh, uh, not that I know of. Not closely, anyway. My my father was a, an only child, and his dad was the only son. And so, uh, aside from my very close family, the only Schmidt relatives that I would have were probably still in Germany. Okay. Um, and Don is wondering, in what order did Dayton, Moraine, and NCR country clubs happen? Is NCR today considered continuous with the NCR club of the 1900s? Does that make sense? Um, so the Dayton Country Club was, was kind of grew out of a, a nine hole golf course that stood in what had been called Oakwood Park, just to the west of the five points intersection. And, and I think that uh, then they bought the, the Kramer Winery and Pleasure Gardens in West Oakwood in the, oh boy, it was the late, right around 1910-ish, I, I forget the date, and that was the Dayton Country Club established there. Um, and then the Moraine Country Club, that was on Mr. Deeds's property, and I think the time frame of that might be more 1920s-ish, possibly. And then adjoining that is the southern portion of the what's now the NCR Country Club. And the dates of that are a little later. I, I forget the time frame, maybe kind of getting into the 1950s, actually. Um, an interesting resource is the Olmstead Online. Um, the uh, resource, the, um, the Olm, many of the Olmstead records have been preserved and actually digitized. And so if you do a search on Olmstead Online and uh, nose around on the map for a while, you can find uh, some of the various Olmstead sites. They, the uh, NCR Country Club to the south of town was one of their last projects in Dayton uh, came, I think, a little after the Carolyn Park area. I wish we had more time to talk about the Olmsteads, but if you, 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 you look around in there long enough, you will find um, uh, old photographs of the development of not only the NCR Country Club, but, but Old River Park, um, uh, Kills and Dales, uh, the Old Barn Club, the Olmsteads consulted on many, many projects and topic of maybe another future presentation. 
Hope that answers your question about the golf courses, Donna. And I think a question repeated from earlier from Annie, did Rubicon Road run from the homestead to the new home? Uh, so Rubicon was the name of the Patterson's uh, farm. Um, there is a Rubicon Road that's kind of cut off by what became the National Cash Register property. So there's a portion of that running to the north up toward the Miami Valley Hospital area. And then to the south, Rubicon comes up from the former NCR property. It crosses Far Hills, runs into the West Oakwood area, and then comes up and meets Thruston, I believe. And now I've lost track of what the original question was. Is it just whether the, the Rubicon Road connected the um, homestead with the new home uh, is how it was stated. Uh, oh, uh, with it, it didn't connect with Far Hills, the Far Hills estate. If 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 that's if that's what you're referring to, the the Far Hills um, basically was accessed from that five points intersection where where Oakwood Avenue and Far Hills come together. So Rubicon trended off more toward the west from there. Okay. And a question from Patricia, are there any items left from the clubs, like um, kitchen items, cookbooks, dishes on display anywhere? Uh, not that I'm aware of, unfortunately. All of that stuff would have been sold off, of course. Um, and presumably some of it still exists, but I, I don't know of, of anything that's, that's, that's on public display, I'm afraid. Okay, and we're going to cut some more comments about John Patterson. Patricia says, isn't it great that John Patterson seems to be the founder of employer appreciation? He, he's a fascinating figure. I'm, I'm actually uh, about a quarter of the way through a, a biography of him. I've been surprised in the course of doing research that no thorough a biographical study of him has been published. So I've, I've enjoyed reading and, and researching him. Yes, he was, um, he was an interesting man, had his uh, tremendous energy, had his hands in all sorts of business innovations, uh, employee welfare, modern sales, advertising, um, uh, commission sales, uh, em, em, employee training. He was, he was fascinating. Um, well, to add to it, Tim Patterson adds, um, I'm sure you're aware that John H. fired a number of people who started many important businesses, Tom Watson, uh, Mr. Kettering, Mr. Sloan, Colonel Deeds, and more. Um, I lived next to Tom Watson's daughter and had an opportunity to talk to Mr. Watson about that. Oh, wow. Maybe there's a contact to be made there. That's wonderful. Yes, I, uh, Tom Watson, um, you know, one of our... Uh, country's most talented businessman uh, got his start at National Cash Register and maybe one of Mr. Patterson's not too bright moments. He fired Mr. Watson, but um, Watson held no animosity as far as I know about that. And he was thankful for his rest of his life from the, the start in business that Johnny Patterson gave him. And any comments here that he fired Kettering four times? <laughs> uh, Deeds uh, kept hiring him back. Supposedly, despite having grown up on a farm, Kettering didn't handle horses very well, and uh, uh, much to, to Patterson's chagrin. And so he kept telling Deeds to fire him, and Deeds says, yeah, yeah, I'll be sure to take care of that. And he, 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 but he kept hiring him back or never firing him in the first place. All right, well, we have a couple more, but I just wanted to, we had a question about um, obtaining a copy of the presentation. So uh, we do have a recording of the presentation that will get shared with everyone who registered for the event. Um, so look for an email for, with that. Um, the, so some of the final questions are just, what's left that you can see now that remains um, from the park? like uh, chimneys from the different camps, um, uh, other shelters that may still be in existence. It's, it's fun to wander through the park as, as we saw the uh, Inspiration Camp sh uh, chimney 
is still there. If you get off the, the beaten path a little bit and wander through some of the, the, the more like deer trails, you see old fence posts. And I am always scratching my head over things that I see. There are traces of fire pits. And you see, as, as was mentioned, these early roads. There's wonderful old fence, uh, see portions of, of the, the old wire fences that maybe even predate the park that go back to the, the farmland. Um, Round Camp was accessible off a turnoff from Patterson that if you are, um, if you, if you have a sharp eye coming just downhill to the south from the Patterson Memorial Monument, it stands across the street and you see some of the, the posts that stood marking the turnoff for round camp. Um, I, I don't, can't think of any other conspicuous uh, remnants. Uh, the uh, Adirondack camp stood, as we said, where the, the log structure was. That was built in the 1950s on the same site. And again, of course, those paved roads, many remnants of the early park and that, that old turnoff that I mentioned off of West Dorothy, uh, kind of an interesting artifact from early days of Hills and Dale. Okay, so um, I have a couple of people with their hands raised, so maybe they have something they'd like to share. Um, so I have more from Tim. Um, when my wife and I moved to the Oregon district, the first name on the deed was Robert Patterson. The date of the purchase was 1829, the year that the Miami Erie Canal opened. Robert had founded Lexington and moved to Dayton from there about 1824 or so. Mr. Watson told me that when he was fired, he left young, capable, and a little angry. That anger fueled a lot of ambition. Ah, uh-huh. One of the stories that you hear a lot about John H. Patterson is the idea that the term fired originated with him and that employees who were fired would come to the, the NCR building and they would see their desks on fire out on the lawn and that that's how they knew they had been terminated. I've never seen anything direct evidence of that, uh, any interviews or newspaper articles, but a, according to one of Watson's biographers, Watson himself told that story over, over time. Um, so he may have seen something that, that I haven't uncovered in any of my research, but apparently that was one of Watson's favorite stories about Patterson and, and the fact that he, seem to remain loyal to Patterson later in his life suggests to me that, that maybe he wasn't making it up, but if anybody knows where that story came from, any specific uh, details about it, I'd, I'd certainly be interested in, in getting some documentation of that. Very good. So um, this chat is wonderful, a lot of information in it. So we'll, we'll save it. And anyone who is attending, um, you can save the chat um, if you, go to the right of where you type in the message, there's three dots and you have an option there to save chat and you're, you're welcome to do that to, to save some of this conversation. Um, I just wanna go ahead and thank David again. Uh, this has been just a wonderful presentation. And again, we will be sharing um, the link to the recording so that you can um, dive back into it or share it with other people who may have interest. I also wanna remind you about our November event with Tom Morrow. Um, going over how Oakwood grew, plat by plat. As David said, it's, it's a wonderful presentation and um, Oakwood residents, you'll get a real kick out of seeing how, uh, where you live developed over time and how your house, you know, what, at what point your house popped up in the, in the history. Um, so again, thank you to everyone uh, for attending and um, uh, we hope to see you next month.